Hello, uh, my name is Cuivin McCumacy, and I'm going to be presenting part three of my series of talks on what was the USSR. The idea from, from the title came from a magazine online called Aufheben. Uh, this is this is my my version of of the of the Aufheben perspective. It's more practical than theirs. Theirs is much more theoretical. The uh, so th this is part three, and we will be dealing with the arts, sciences, and sport. The arts will take pre precedence in my case because this is the field I'm most familiar with but we will also discuss the sciences and sport. We will also deal with education. Uh, next slide. So one of the biggest, this is, we're now dealing with the, with the arts first, the art with a capital A, as in paintings and so on and so forth. Uh, a huge influence on, Soviet era modernist art was that of Wassily Kandinsky. Uh, he's an international artist in many respects, but he was born in Odessa and was of Russian extraction. He, uh, he became as successively he became a key figure in, in the school of Im Impressionism. This was towards the end of the 19th century. And that's late Impressionism and pointillism and symbolism and, fine, and then on to Expressionism, where he became, he was in Germany by this point, and he uh, was a founder member of the Blau Reiter group or Blue Rider group. And he led the way uh, as well into full abstraction and suprematism. So you can see an example of suprematism on the left and a late expressionist painting of his, which is, 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 uh, is virtually completely abstract. He was, uh, when he, he became, when he went to the Soviet Union, he went to the Soviet Union when, when, the, when the revolution took place, and he, he got involved in the in, in the music scene there, uh, on the, the music scene, the the art scene there, and then from from that he 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 left he left there the direction which the he felt he felt at odds with the materialist end of the uh, art which was being encouraged there. He felt he was more spiritual orientated, and so he moved to Germany, where he joined the the Bauhaus group, the early Bauhaus group. Next slide. So Kazimir Malevich also has to be mentioned. He was another hugely influential figure behind the development of avant-garde uh, suprematism and constructivism. So you can see the, the geometric shapes that he's using. He's using uh, rectilinear forms and lines and, and triangles and circles. These are the, are the main ingredients of, of his art. And, but uh, again, as with Kandinsky, though he didn't leave the Soviet Union, he found himself uh, more at odds with the political course of events as the 20s developed, and he turned back to figure painting, which was where he ended his career. That's portrait figures, mainly. Uh, next slide. So the two most in favor constructivist artists of the 1920s were Alexander Rodchenko and Bavara Stepanova. You can see them both on the left. 
and they were in, in, their, in their studio. They were a couple. I'm not sure if they got married or not, but they were certainly in, in, closely involved with each other's work all the way through their, their artistic careers. And they worked in a variety of different mediums and they helped to develop the modern concepts of graphic design. You can see the, the, the image there below on the, on, on the right. And that is a classic example of what would, what in, in modern, in modern uh, gra graphic design, this is the, this sort of uh, arrangement of, 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 of colors and space and images are these, they derive from, from the work of Rodchenko. And Stepanova is mainly remembered for her textile and fashion designs, but it must be remembered that she was in close collaboration with Rodchenko all through all of, all of, his, of his artworks as well. So he is a, a uh, the, um, that Stepanova's influence on him must be must be understood in this context. And um, next slide. So as all these images illustrate, uh, Rodchenko and his and his wife, they also worked in photography, in furniture and interior design, and in sculpture. The chess duo of chairs and table and pieces. The, this, is, the, this is very famous, the red and the black of the chairs mirroring the red and the black of the, of the squares on the chessboard and also of the, of the, of the counters. Uh, and the counters were themselves quite different from the normal, normal chess counters. And you could swivel the, the table around so you could play from one end or the other end as you see fit. And the photographs, these are, are influential, I would argue, on the development of cinema. They, they especially the, the, uh, the, the steps one, it seems to, to look, look ahead to, to what uh, Eisenstein, for instance, is going to do with the Odessa steps scene in, in Battleship Potemkin. And similarly on the, on, on the right, you have, you have imagery which ties in with, with some uh, 1920s, German expressionist film, uh, the the use of perspective in this in this uh, in this case. Next slide. So Soviet constructivism's main avant-garde influence uh, was in design and architecture. It paralleled the later Bauhaus developments in Berlin. Uh, Berlin had originally not been based in, in Berlin, but it was later on, and it became, became very much associated with constructivism. The Zuev Workers Club in Moscow is a good architectural example of both. It, the, both schools were very closely aligned. The other, other experimental art forms, it has to be stated, they, they also flourished under the 1920s uh, Soviet Commissar of Art. He, his name was Lunacharsky. And he was seen as being a liberal figure who was very much liked by artists. They, they found him very approachable. And he intervened often to, to take the rough edges off what the, the the authorities, the, the Communist Party leadership thought of it. 
and um, and they and while he was he was in 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 the office of commissar, he he also permitted primitivism and futurism, which you can see an example of futurism below. Uh, next slide. But uh, Lunacharsky was removed in 19, I think it was 1927 or 28. And the, but it must be remembered that right from the word go, the CPSU bans numerous modernist artworks. And for no rational reason, except that some influential party bigwig has uh, dismissed it as bourgeois, degenerate, or any other label he cared to, to put on it, mainly just because he personally didn't like it. Uh, you can see all the artworks here were suppressed in the 1920s, and they were deposited in a vault in Nukus, uh, the Uzbekistan Soviet Socialist Republic, where they remain, but now in a gallery. They're now being transferred to a gallery, they were originally in, in a vault all the way through the entire history of the Soviet Union. And later, with the, the, the new Russian government showed no interest in restoring them back to, say, Russia. But the, so, the, so the, these works remain in Nukas, Uzbekistan, where you can view them today. And ironically, many of these works were in fact highly critical of bourgeois society. You can see the pictures on the on the left there. They are they both are reminiscent of the of German art of the period, for instance, by Otto Dix or by George Grosch. The picture at the bottom there is is not political at all. It, but it's very expressionistic, and um, that one was banned as well. Why? I have no idea. Next slide. So between the late 1920s and the early 1930s, the art form to become dominant in the USSR right up until the end, that's right up until the 1980s, was this form called realism. And in particular, it's party propaganda form of socialist realism. Uh, this, mean, this meant it was basically a, it had to have overt political content as well as the realism aspect to it. Realism has been much derided as a reactionary conservative turn in, in the arts. And that, that can be said with some justification. It varied from the pure kitsch, uh, which you can see on the right, uh, with Stalin holding up a young boy or girl or whatever, who's holding flowers and, and the Soviet flag, to neoclassicist uh, below, which is a very conservative art form as well and mirrored actually Nazi, Nazi obsession with this form. Uh, but this is not the whole story of Sov Soviet realism. So we will see this in the next slide. Next slide. So beyond the stereotype, and in particular after the death of Stalin, it has to be said, Many Soviet artists found it more productive to stay within the ideological emphasis on realism so that they could escape censorship and earn a living. Yet they would still be able to express their own subtleties and innovations within these constraints. You can see two examples here. One, uh, the one on the right is probably more impressionistic than anything else, and it it gives the the, the characters uh, they they have their own their own identity. 
the the picture on the on the bottom there that is on the left that is uh, of skiers in in the snow and there's an embankment at the top with a, a railway and a and, and train and it's viewed through the trees with this backdrop of light uh, and it, it's it's also classed as, as realism. And they, they were able to get away with this, the artists, they were able to get away with it. But uh, they, you can, you can see that these are proper, are proper, are proper works of art. The, the one on the, on, on the left in particular probably harks to Chinese or especially Japanese art. I think we are too often programmed to think that the censorship of the arts was uh, is some is is a feature somehow unique to the USSR. This same critique can be leveled at the art scene in the West, for example. And while the terminology may differ, it becomes you know the the market has decided not to publish you or whatever and instead of the party says you can't publish but it's it's a different it's a different terminology but the end result is exactly the same outsider creatives are left to struggle on in poverty and obscurity next slide so we'll talk a little bit on brutalism now, brutalism, mainly in architecture, but also in sculpture, especially within the USSR, is often incorrectly blamed on, on the USSR and its, uh, its, its Warsaw Pact allies as being something unique to them. Unfortunately, that was not the case. It was also very prevalent in the West during the 1950s to 70s. And observers are challenged to discern the difference between these two examples here. So you have on one side, you've got the office building and that's from Eastern Europe, I believe. And then on the other side, you have uh, a tower block of, of houses. And this, is, and this is in London, it's still standing today. So, so you can, you can see that there's that there's a uh, that it, it's it's not something unique to to the Soviet Union. But what it does maybe show is it does maybe show a parallel attitude or a, or a parallel approach to the, the working class because it it's considered it's it's considered okay to stick the the working class in basically large filing cabinets and then to police them within that then then you have institutions in in the as in the as in the picture over there on the on the left the the office block which is which is uh, again again it is it is it is it is it is reinforcing this idea that that uh, this is this is what what the ruling people think of working class people that that this is this is all they deserve and it it betrays something to my mind uh, I would just say another one little bit about the Treptower Park in Berlin. I visited that in the Soviet War Memorial. It's a huge, big part of the park. It's, uh, I would challenge people, it, it is hideous, but I would challenge people not to be affected by it. It does have, a, it does have an impact on you. And despite all its, its, its it, it is harsh. It is it's, it's extremely harsh and it's extremely ugly in many respects. But on the other hand, it, it does affect you. And that's all I've got to say about it. It is worth a visit. Next slide. 
And one must also be aware that even in a totalitarian society, people will find clever and devious ways to resist oppression. Uh, this, this is an example I found online of a monstrous pig that appeared in a 1928 demonstration, arts demonstration in Moscow. And one can see it in perhaps two very different ways. Now, what the builders of it probably told the, the authorities was that, that this was a sculpture extolling industrialized agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, and collectivization and so on and so forth. And the, and the authorities probably ticked tick their boxes on their, on their wee form. And then they said, right, you can, you can carry on and present this. So it was brought out, it was trundled out on a, on a trolley as it seems to be in this picture and pulled along. And if you notice in the background, however, there's a picture of Joseph Stalin. And could these two images actually be related? It's not, it's not certain, nobody knows. Uh, the, but it's, it's, it is a possibility that the artists were uh, thought that this is, this is a great joke to have Stalin alongside a, the, a sculpture of a, of a gigantic pig. And in fact, I'm sure this, I feel certain that this image was viewed originally by George Orwell uh, when in the, when he saw it in, in a paper and he probably cut it out. And then he was thinking of what, what he would write later on, Animal Farm and the, parallel, of course, with, with uh, in, as in the picture, with Napoleon and, and, and Stalin, Napoleon being the giant pig, is obviously, I think this is obviously where he got his idea from. Next slide. Okay, so we'll move on to the written word now. Aware of its power, the Soviet authorities were very vigilant about censoring the written word. In fact, they were so vigilant that virtually no uh, Soviet author, unless they were really towing the line of this, of this, of this period, uh, escaped it. Uh, Mikhail Bulgakov's famous novels, The White Guard, that's the picture that's the cover on the, on, the, on the left, and Master and Margarita, which is the cover in the middle, uh, were outstanding works of literature that remained unpublished during the author's lifetime. Uh, perhaps the cruelest blow was Stalin personally, because Bulgakov knew Stalin on a personal basis, and Stalin, and sorry, Bulgakov was begging Stalin to, to, uh, to publish his, his, his novels. He, he completely dismissed Mar Master Margarita, but he, 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 he uh, apparently he told Bulgakov how much he loved the White Guard. In fact, he said he'd read it several times, but it's still, he still wouldn't allow it to be published because he was afraid of what the consequences might be. So Bulgakov's savage satire has never, not necessarily should be seen as anti-communist. He certainly poked merciless fun at uh, the hypocrisies and the absurdities of the new state and its, its ideological bent. Uh, but he was very even-handed in his critique. If you see the picture on the, on the, on the right, of the, of the slide. This is, this, is, uh, this is from a more, well, 1990s. So, so that's post-Soviet uh, adap ad adaptation of one of his short stories known as Heart of a Dog. And 
he 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 doesn't he doesn't uh, he doesn't spare anybody within this. So he has a very uh, capitalistic orientated main character within it, and he doesn't spare him, and he doesn't spare the the committee which which uh, which run run the block in in which in which. Uh, the the action action takes place and he doesn't spare the the authorities and he he's basically having having a go at everybody so i think one can say that bulgakov he seems to be even hopeful that lessons could be learned next slide another highly talented uh author who was a socialist and he remained unflinching in his truth telling this was to lead to his downfall unfortunately uh, was Isaac Babel from Odessa uh, in again in the in the in, in the west of the Ukraine with his gritty tales of the civil war which he recounts in Red Cavalry. You can see the cover on the left. And Odessa Tales, which was a collection of humanist stories from the, from the Odessa Jewish ghetto. So their main character in them is an anti-hero. Uh, unlike most no non-conformist artists. Most non-conformist artists in the USSR, whether for the most part they were just either stifled or they were ignored. But Babel was was put on a Stalin death list, and he was tortured and murdered. Next slide. So we have some other written art, word artists uh, who had tr troubled and ambivalent relationships with the state. And these were Anna Akhmatova, for instance, on the left, which that's in the painting by Malevich, who we've already been discussing, and Boris Pasternak, who was a poet and an author, and he's on the right. Boris Pasternak, of course, is very famous for writing Dr. Zhivago, which has been, of course, made into a, a big Hollywood film in the 1960s. But it was originally, uh, he is mainly seen in Russia as a poet rather than, a, than an author, despite his, the, the fame of his book. And, and both uh, Pasternak and Akhmatova's poetry are very powerful. Next slide. So by the late period, official state policy towards writers who expressed ideas that were, as they put it, incompatible with socialism was usually to ostracize them and then force them into exile. And this was the fate of quite a lot of them. For instance, Solzhenitsyn is probably the most famous example. And the poet Brodsky, uh, you can see him below with a kitten on his shoulder, very fond of cats. And author Dovlatov, um, who's on the left. The dissident writer movement, they, they, the, this movement, started up uh, called the, uh, the well, they were known in the West as the dissident writers. It was largely a, con con uh, a contrivance of, of the West because they, in fact, these, these authors uh, didn't, and poets, they, they didn't see eye to eye with each other. They all had different opinions. And they, and they also, it has to be said, none of them, certainly at the time, none of them had any connection to the mass of people in the, in the, in the USSR. So they, 
So unfortunately, they once they had been forced out of the country, then they were often turned into propaganda tools of the West. And um, and the and the dissident writer movement collapsed in the 1980s, partly from its own internal contradictions, as much as through the changing times, because by this point the 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 whole Soviet system was starting to break down. Next slide. Right, we move on to music and dance now. So in the 1920s to 1970s, saw a period of internationally acclaimed success for Soviet trained musicians, singers and dancers. So you can see the Bolshoi dance school there, that's on the bottom left. And that was expanded. It was originally started, of course, in Tsarist times, but it, it expanded hugely during, during, the, during the Soviet era. And it produced top performing ballerinas like Olga Lepeshinskaya. You can see her, I think she's dancing Don Quixote. That's in 1940, up at the top left. And then the uh, we have to talk about the Soviet Army Ensemble, uh, or, the, or the Red Army Choir as well. These, the, this was the Red Army Choir that traveled Europe, and they were they were stunning performers, really stunning performers. My my father used to be in the in the Communist Party. He was you know, of Ireland. He was a big he was a big big uh, fan of the, of the Soviet army ensemble, even after he left the Communist Party. And, uh, and, they, uh, and they performed all over Europe and they did a, 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 a variation of different, of different, uh, of different songs. Some, some of the songs they sung were Russian songs and some of them were, were or, of a European or, or even North American origin and uh, mostly sung in the English language. Before we move on, we'll also mention that the performing arts and entertainment also flourished. Uh, this is in particular circuses. You probably heard of the Moscow State Circus, and that was only the, that, that was the sort of top end of it. But the circuses and and like and like um, performances were were in generic throughout throughout the Soviet Union, and they 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 got great interest from from the general public, and they and they excelled in their in their in their art form. Next slide. So Soviet composers would have, a, they might have a strained relationship with the state, but in general, they fared a lot better than, than the writers whom we've already been dealing with. The, there is uh, Aram Kachaturian, you can see him on the left. He was an Armenian. And for example, he pursued a very successful career. He only had one glitch in it. And that was when Stalin in one of his, uh, his purge moments, he decided that anybody who, was to be, who could be labeled as a formalist, whatever a formalist was, would be purged uh, from, from their positions. And he briefly lost his high position in, in, the, in the Soviet Union, but that was only for uh, a few weeks or a, a few months. And by this time, Stalin had moved on from one label to another label and informalism, whatever formalism was, was, not, was no longer applicable. So he got his job back. Uh, Sergei Prokofiev, of course, is a very famous composer. He fell into disfavor in, with the, in uh, with his late 1920s uh, Dance of Steel, 
Uh, you can see that one above that was premiered. It says previewed there, but it should say premier. Premiered in, in Paris and he chose exile for a while. Uh, but that didn't last very long. Stalin asked him to return, which he did. And he was re rehabilitated. He wasn't sent to a gulag. He wasn't shot. He wasn't uh, tortured or whatever. He was, uh, he was soon to become the USSR's favorite composer. Uh, you've probably heard of Peter and the Wolf. That's probably his most famous work. Dmitry Shostakovich, he, he was much more avant-garde as you might uh, ex express it. And on the other hand, he had a really terrible relationship with, with Stalin. They, they really didn't get on. They didn't see eye to eye, though, though Stalin seems to have, have um, appreciated his, his work to a degree. But they 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 were always at, at odds with each other, and Shostakovich really suffered under under Stalin's whims, and th this is probably reflected in the discordant nature of his work. Next slide. So we're now going to talk briefly about electronic music in the Soviet Union. So while the world was focused on the great accomplishments of, of classical music and dance in the USSR, an obscure underground scene was developing around electronic music. The movie, if you've ever seen it, or you have, if you haven't, you should see it, it tells this fascinating story about how such, uh, it's called Electro Moskva, and it, it tells you about how these pioneers got started uh, from the 1950s up, up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And they were pretty much ignored by the, by the cultural police because uh, the, the cultural police just really didn't understand what they were doing and they just left them to it. As you can see, they, they didn't have very much facilities. This is the the, these two artists here at the bottom, this is a more modern picture of them. They, they went back to the, to the garage, which they'd used to, to, to make and record all their, all their, all their music. And, they, and they, these, these people were secretly fusing unwieldy Soviet techno gadgetry and computers together in a in a manner that was that's very similar to similar developments in much more that were made in much more congenial environments for musical experimentation, for instance, by John Cage in New York or by maybe Brian Eno in London. Uh, the, the there was there was a group of, of Soviet artists doing exactly the same thing, but but in in garages and passing around cassettes, but hand to hand to to uh, to pass on on the message of of what they were doing. Next slide. So Soviet cinema, of course, is world famous. And it got a groundbreaking start in uh, right from the word go, in fact. And the use of this medium were for spreading the word, of course, was encouraged by the CPSU leadership, including uh, no other than Lenin and Trotsky themselves, who were big fans of the of of the cinema, both. They seem to be both really excited by it, and also they appreciated its propagandistic qualities as well. The unforgettable Odessa step scene from Battleship Chemkin is shown above. That's where the the uh, the pram descends down the down the steps. Uh, after everybody's been, been, been shot down 
and, and the mother is dead and the pram with the baby in it is, is also trundling down the steps. And also another, another movie made at the time, which, is, which I would recommend to people is, is Man with a Movie Camera, which is, I think it was 1922, in fact, it was really quite early on. You can see the constructivist poster there on the right for it. And the, uh, it's, 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 it's imagery, it plays with, it plays with all, all kinds of, of illusions which you can make with, with a camera. And they certainly influenced Louis Buñuel and Salvador Dali when they made L'Age d'Or and Chien Andalou. Next slide. Uh, the more inspiring e experimentation with the cinematic form followed. And you can see a uh, still from Eisenstein's strike there on the left. And we have to talk about as well the railway construction documentary called Turksib, which was about the building of the first Turkmenistan railway from Siberia in order to get the the cotton that was picked there out of, of Turkmenistan. And the, the, this movie was released in 1930. It comes right at the end of this great rush, uh, this first great creative rush of Soviet cinema. Uh, the 1930s to 50s movie industry by and large had had, was to, now follow the strict austere guidelines of socialist realism. But in the, in the montage scene, which you see in, in, in Turksib, you see a train running along the tracks and you get montaged images, one on top of each other. And there are horsemen, uh, nomad horsemen riding alongside the, the, the train, they're trying to overtake the train, but the train is overtaking them. And it's, uh, and, the, and you get close-ups of the wheels going round and round and round. And these are all montaged on top of one, of one on top of the other. It is really worth uh, seeing for that scene alone. Uh, also worthy of mention is the Ukrainian SSR movie, Arsenal. This was a powerful 1929 anti-war movie uh, where the heroes and villains are not very easily identified. Starts off in the middle of the First World War and there's some quite, there's some, some quite powerful images of the, of the First World War. And then it ends up in, 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 the, in the Russian Revolution and in this working class suburb of Kiev that was known as Arsenal, where the workers take over the factories, they drive out the white forces. But then towards the end of the movie, the red forces come in and they start to oppress them, the workers as well. And, there's, and they start shoot and the, and the workers are shot at. So, so you see that you can see why it was banned, basically. Next slide. So Soviet cinema doesn't really start to recover its stride until about the 1960s. You get cinematic adapt adapt adaptations of Russian literary e epics, such as Sir Sergei uh, Bondarchuk's Eight Hour War and Peace, if you've ever seen that. The, the Borodino battle sequence where the French are fighting the, the Russians. It uses cameras on overhead cables and most of the Red Army seems to be there as extras. There are just so many people running around all dressed up in Napoleonic uniforms and you get these marvelous views from above, sort of like an eagle eye view of the battlefield. Uh, also, 
school design of uh, crime and punishment, you can see that below. It sort of harks back to 1920s expressionism, the cinema or the German cinema of, for instance, of, of Lang and Murnau. And it has to be said as well, early Tarkovsky movies, get, they get an airing in this period. These are moody experimental pieces such as Ivan's childhood. Next slide. Soviet cinema in the 1960s, 70s, not only adapts classics of Russian literature, there, there's another one that's very worth talking about. That's the, the version of the Brothers Karamazov, but also international ones such as Shakespeare's stage drama, King Lear, uh, opposite and below, as you can see, these, these images are very, are very powerful and they, the, the whole movie is in fact extremely powerful. And I would put it on a par with maybe Akira Kosawa's Ran, which is another adaptation of King Lear. Next slide. So Tarkovsky in the 1970s, he kicks off with a, an adaptation of Stanislaw Lem's uh, novel called Solaris. And this is a science fiction novel. And he aimed to express his profound sense of disappointment that he'd felt after watching Kubrick's 2001. He felt that 2001 Space Odyssey had not spoken to him on a spiritual level at all, or anything to do with the human, human, human condition. He felt it was lacking in that department. And so he, he made Solaris. Uh, Solaris doesn't make much sense if you, if you, if you watch it as, as a movie, but it certainly leaves an impression on your mind. It, uh, and it has a lot to say about, about, about the human, human condition, a lot. Uh, that's all I'll say about that one. But he follows that up by Stalker. And Stalker is an equally mysterious and enigmatic movie. It's set in the zone, as he calls it, which is a sort of post-apocalyptic wasteland, almost, uh, almost looking forward to, 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 to the disasters which, which are going to take place in, in the 1980s. Uh, where a man is being is being guided in in search of the source for of of all dreams, and nothing is what it seems. Characters appear, disappear, all sorts of stuff goes on. Really worth seeing as well. Next slide. So Akira Kurosawa, the Japanese director, he went to the Soviet Union to make uh, an adaption, adaptation of the Russian uh, exploration memoir, Der Suazala. This is a, a memoir of, by an explorer who had, ex who had been, been mapping Siberia in the, at the start of the of the of the twentieth century, and it's it's another brilliant movie. Uh, the the acting is phenomenal. The scenery is phenomenal, and the and it's again from the, this final glory period of Soviet cinema. And last but by no means least, Elam Klimov's Come and See. This has rightly been lauded as the greatest anti-war movie ever made. Uh, Soviet World War II movies, by the way, as you might expect, they are plentiful. There's a lot of them. But by and large, well, not all of them, but by and large, 
they are a lot more moving and realistic than any of the Western equivalents that were produced during the same era. And um, Come and See certainly stands out a mile for its sheer relentlessness of surreal horror. So that's the poster for Come and See there on the, on, on the right. And incidentally, it, it is actually based on reality. It, it's based on what happened in, in Belarus during the, during the Nazi occupation, where hundreds, hundreds of villages suffered the same fate as, um, as is depicted in this, in this movie. Next slide. So before we leave cinematic productions, we should also mention Soviet TV. By the 1970s, most people in the Soviet Union have a TV and are watching it. And the Soviet TV production companies, they are producing many popular and creative works. Uh, there is the children's miniseries called Inventors of the Electronic, which was extremely popular with Soviet children to a degree probably matching that of Harry Potter in the, in the West today. And also what movie critics say is the best ever ad adaptation of Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes tales. You can see that. A, that example above. Next slide. So despite attempts to tamper with science uh, as well in an ideological manner, this was largely restricted to biology and it did not last much beyond the 1950s. This was in, in relation mainly to gene biology the, the uh, authorities had developed an ideological objection to it, which held it back for a while, but the, and it was, it was not officially renounced until the, until the mid 1960s, but people had pretty much forgotten about the, the ideological uh, restrictions on it much before that. So probably in the 1950s, early 1950s, he was already in the back burner. Uh, chemistry, physics and maths produce excellence uh, during this period, right the way through. And this is partly because these subjects uh, are very useful obviously in developing of industry and they were highly encouraged by the state. Uh, partly also because of the Soviet education system, which was acknowledged even in the West as being able to achieve exemplary results. Next slide. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Irina Starikova. Uh, she was she was born in northern Siberia, and she's a mathematician, and she will be uh, talking to us about about the about the Soviet education system. I've managed to arrange an interview. She's currently living in Brazil, uh, and and she's a philosopher of mathematics, and she researches in visualizations and thought experiments. Um, Irina, do you want to add, add anything else to that? Yes, yes. Um, so I have a mathematical background, but I am uh, doing research in philosophy of mathematics. And uh, yes, it's uh, visualizations in mathematics, mathematical aesthetics as well. And uh, I met, uh, I met uh, Kevin in Bristol where I was doing my PhD. And uh, I also studied in Budapest in uh, Central European University. And I had a postdoc in uh, Sao Paulo State University. So it's a great pleasure for me 
to be invited to this interview. Kevin. Thank you, Irina. Uh, could you just um, briefly explain to me your how you experienced life on a, on a general basis uh, as a child when you were growing up in the Soviet Union? I was a happy child. Um, I, I loved my family. Um, I loved school. It was very interesting. I had great summers, um, holidays, and um, um, I did lots of sports, lots of activities. Um, we had a so-called uh, pioneers palace where we could do some crafts and uh, pursue our interests sort of classes, I did class in art. And um, yes, it was great. Um, what was the most frustrating? It was the climate, <laughs> very <laughs> long, cold winters. Uh, mind yeah. you, I was born in North Siberia. And uh, when it was below 53, we were allowed not to go to school. Can you imagine? <laughs> when, it, when it was when it was minus twenty, it was great, and okay. we could do skiing, skating, and uh, all the snow and ice uh, activities. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, can you please give me or or give us a general overview of the late Soviet? education system as you experienced it uh, in 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 that in that period which i okay. guess would be what what would it be sort of it was the uh, late 70s early 80s okay um, so um, the school system was um uh, first of all school education was uh, obligatory uh, and uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, eight years it was obligatory. And after eight years, those who had uh, not so excellent grades would go to work or would go to professional um, development um, institutions where they would study uh, two more years to become a carpenter or uh, a plumber or they would study four years to become a nurse, um, um, some, some more advanced professional um, worker, right? And those who would stay in school, uh, they could study two more years, and this would call the high school, uh, comparative to the earlier stage of middle school. And then after the two years, one could go to the university. Oh. I thought university is obligatory, <laughs> was obligatory. Oh. When, my mom, when my mom mentioned that uh, it was so tough for her that uh, she, she could have not go to university, I was surprised. So I did go to the university. And then oh. uh, at the university, it's five years. Uh, it used to be five years. And then uh, when uh, in late 90s, 90s, they uh, did it four years for bachelor degree and two more years for master's degree. And then you can go to um, to um, uh, to do kandidatska, which was like two years, uh, and then doctorate. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Um, so, how many? Oh, oh sorry. How, how did the Top end specialized schools fit into this. Um, how many? How many were there across the USSR, roughly? Um, and how many? How many pupils? Uh, I would imagine we're talking about the mathematical uh, type ones at the moment. And um, and what were the speciality topics of each each category? If if you know. Mm. Uh, I studied in a physical mathematical school uh, in Novosibirsk. It was founded by um, Mikhail Lavrentiev, 
uh, a famous physics, physicist, uh, the founder of uh, the Institute of Explosion, of Physics of Explosion, <laughs> and one of the develop uh, developers of um, nuclear bomb in uh, Soviet Union. Um, so uh, uh, the school was uh, uh, established in uh, 1963, and at the same year, uh, three more schools were founded in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Kiev, Ukraine now. Uh, uh, in the first year uh, in Novosibirsk, um, there were 100 students, and uh, nowadays they have 500 students. Um, something like two, 250 uh, teachers. Um, most of them are scientists. Uh, as far as I remember, um, the school uh, have, have the uh, yeah, the graduates. The, there are 500 uh, graduates with a doctorate degree. All right. Okay. Um, just one question that arises is where um, somebody told me that there were two types of specialized school. There was, there was the top end ones, but there are also ones for specialized schools for children with the learning or other, other difficulties. Do you know anything about these ones or not? Uh, right. Um, um, this school, uh, this uh, physical mathematical school, uh, the specialization in, in sciences, um, and it's a, it's a boarding school, so children could, uh, could stay uh, in, in the city. Uh, the school has four buildings, two buildings uh, for um, two dormitories, uh, uh, one uh, dining, building and uh, one uh, school for, for studying building. Uh, so um, boarding schools, so they're called internats. Uh, they're also for uh, children who have no families so or who have incomplete and uh, poor families. Uh, and uh, they had uh, different curriculum. Of course, there are also um, other uh, schools specialized in ballet, um, yeah. sports, ballet sports, that, that, as far as I know. Okay. Um, now, how did the selection process take place for a top end specialized school? Was, uh, was the, um, I mean, what proportion of the, of, students for instance would come from you know at a top end school what would would they would would a would a, a high proportion come from ordinary ordinary backgrounds like working class or peasant families for instance um, um, you know? i don't know the proportion exactly but uh, i would have thought that um, uh, at that time uh, uh, families would have support um, anyway. And um, I don't know, for, not, for us, for kids, it was difficult to understand that uh, somebody is really, really poor. Uh, as far as I saw, we had equally, we had some, everything basics we need. Mm. Okay. Um, sorry. No, no. Were well, you going to add anything else, or shall I make? Uh, yeah, I, I want to say that uh, uh, there was there was a small fee for this school, but uh, it was waived for children from poor families. Okay. okay. With low income. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm um, and and uh, would you would. To, to what extent would you say the specialized schools were a phenomenon of egalitarianism and, and or of and or of elitism would you say that, that there was any any uh, anything to say on that or? well these were definitely elite schools but elites uh, 
in the sense scientifically. So <laughs> um, this, mean, this just means that uh, any one of us could become a famous uh, scientist. Okay. Um, and of course, and it was uh, it, at the same time, it was uh, accessible to any uh, social level. And uh, for children for very remote places uh, in Russia, I was from uh, North uh, Siberia, but I was from the city. And many in my class were from very small, tiny villages. And nevertheless, uh, they were, we all were equal. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Um, so, so what um, did, do you know if if uh, the membership of the party had anything to do with it or not? Um, you mean communist party? Yeah, yeah. Was was there any 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 connection to that or not? Well, Anybody? of course. Uh, uh, Soviet uh, education at all levels uh, was. Um, um, politicalized, and um, there was always propaganda, um, starting from uh, the first class at school, we had so-called uh, organization of October children from mm -hmm. the first to the third class, and then we would um, uh, transmit into another organization, pioneers, young pioneers, and then in the eighth class, we would become com we would become members of Komsomol. Yeah, okay. And uh, I remember myself. I was I was excluded from from Komsomol in uh, at the first year of of the university because. Uh, because it was not, I was not participating anymore. And, okay. uh, but it was already, nobody was participating anymore. <laughs> it was already on the background. Yeah. All right. Okay. Fair enough. Um, in your own school, then, uh, how was teaching and the daily term year curriculum organized? Um, you know, if you can tell us some, some details about that and, and about the things you thought were useful for students and those that you didn't think were useful. Um, could you could you elaborate? Um, in, uh, in, in my normal school, uh, I think uh, it was really great that uh, um, the, uh, we were supposed to help our classmates, um, those who wouldn't be that successful for some reasons. Uh, so I would um, be a tutor of a couple of my classmates. And uh, I think it was good because uh, I learned this experience and um, it was a pleasure for me to help. Um, and then um, at the uh, mathematical school, uh, we have lots of freedom uh, and independence. I think it was a lot. Uh, we had uh, self-ruling days, for example, uh, which means uh, during one week, something like one week or half week, uh, uh, the volunteers would be teaching the subjects uh, they would like to the same to the classmates. I was teaching English. Uh, we could uh, use our own materials and um, introduce uh, the exercises we like. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So um, the subjects, uh, uh, the science subjects, mathematics, physics, chemistry, uh, were framed in the university uh, curriculum way. So we had lectures and we have seminars practical hours. 
Uh, and at the end of the week and at the end of the month, we will have long list of problems to solve. So uh, we were responsible for for quite a lot of things. Uh, um, okay, that's interesting. For the rest of the subjects, uh, they were taught in the same way as in usual schools, but uh, still we have great teachers. Um, we have uh, such classes as uh, the history uh, and, uh, of culture and art with a great uh, mediotheca and with a great collection of classical music, uh, films, um, um, vinyl <laughs> records, and uh, we even had uh, a real instrument. We had a piano. Uh, any any could uh, anyone could uh, take the key in this uh, time and leave the room. I was exercising my piano in the evening, and at the time I really uh, uh, fell in love with uh, Denise Waltzes. By the way, we had a course, a short course uh, on dancing Denise Waltzes just before the graduation, so that. We could be able to dance uh, Dini's vowels on our graduation ball. Okay. Interesting. And um, yeah, I want to add, uh, it was really great, uh, very, really inspiring that uh, on top of obligatory courses, we had uh, facultative, so called, uh, so um, optional courses. Mm -hmm. Uh, in mathematics and physics uh, run by volunteers from uh, research institutes. So those who are real uh, enthusiasts and uh, we could learn from first hand what's going on in this subject and um, they would share the enthusiasm and uh, they were looking for pupils for them so they really were interested in uh, in sharing their knowledge okay that's interesting it um just what was the what was the students relationship with the teachers like i mean i've heard some stories that 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 uh teachers teachers in the soviet union could be quite harsh did, did you have that experience or not um uh yes and no yes yeah that's true they could be very harsh they could uh, tell you at your face that you're a fool <laughs> uh, but uh, not um not so much at uh, at uh, this uh, specialized school although we did have a teacher i remember it was an english teacher and uh, when she was angry with us she would say and you you will go to PED. PED, uh, it was, uh, it's abbreviation of uh, pedagogical institute, which okay. was uh, ranked much lower than the university. Um, but uh, overall, uh, since the majority of uh, our teachers were scientists, and uh, they already saw us as uh, their future colleagues, okay. um, they were very friendly and patient and uh, um, they were uh, we were feeling like equal with them just very young and uh, mm. but uh, they they developed in us this feeling that uh, we are already scientists uh, and uh, we can do what we want and um, I remember um, we had um, um, the competition of uh, fantastic uh, projects. Uh, it actually was in a, in a summer school. So that anybody who wants can present uh, his fantastic uh, projects. Uh, so we were dreaming about building rockets, uh, spaceships, uh, colliders. Wow. Hey. Right. Um, just one last question then. If, if say, the USSR hadn't collapsed, uh, what 
how different do you think your own academic and philosophy of mathematics trajectory might have been? Do you think it would have been different? Sure. Oh, what a thought experiment. <laughs> <laughs> this is my subject of research. <laughs> wow. Mm. Mm. Perhaps uh, I wouldn't become a philosopher. Perhaps I would stay a mathematician or, <laughs> I don't know, a mathematician, yeah. Um, the programmer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Irina, for your for your help and telling us all about the Soviet ed education system that was uh, especially in the specialized schools. That was very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for your interest. No problem. Right. So the in terms of space exploration the west was to get a last the shock in the 1950s because they had always they'd always thought that they were miles ahead of the of the soviet union in terms of technology and certainly in in terms of uh they hadn't even really thought about the exploration of space they were so they were so complacent. It was a bit like the hare and the tortoise thing. And the Soviet Union suddenly surprised the entire world with pioneering developments in the exploration of space. So the first ever satellite, Sputnik 1, you can see that one above there. That was for, for, um, followed shortly by the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin who you see there on the right. And for many years, the Soviet Union was leading in space and the world's attention was on what the Soviets were doing in space. The, it took the US, it took the US probably over a decade to, to, to catch up and it forced them to found NASA and to invest a large share of its budget in NASA. Uh, because up until this point, uh, space exploration being consistently overlooked and underfunded by the US state. Next slide. So we'll move on to sports now. So the USSR clearly saw a great need to compete on every level it could and as much as it could on an equal footing with the Western powers. Now, why does it need to do this? If it is, as it states it is, it, if it's a socialist country, it shouldn't need to do this. Uh, it sh the, the competition is not really, uh, is not really important, should it be. So this perhaps defines the guiding ideology better than any of its, this, this need this need to, to prove itself, which you can see reflected in this picture, which is quite striking. It's, it says quite a lot about the, about, about the psychology of the, of the ruling elite in, in the Soviet Union, because uh, they, they obviously thought that they had something to prove in the Olympic Stadium. You can see all the flags along the, uh, along the along the rim of the stadium. And, the, um, and this woman, she almost seems to be throwing the, the javelin at the audience. Uh, this is like, well, here we are, we finally arrived. And such a conclusion that it also raises further questions as to the real nature of the state itself. You know, it's, is it, what is it? The, the is it, is it really attached to these ideas of Marxism and Leninism, or is it attached to something else? So the the uh, you can see that by the 1950s, Soviet athletes are rapidly catching up with the rest of the world. Next slide. So so these are four of them. 
which I randomly selected more or less out of, uh, out of many. And uh, the, the, and the four are, there's um, on, the, on the left there, you can see Sergei Bubka. He, uh, he is a, his international career in pole vaulting starts in 1983. Uh, he invents a new style, which is basically he holds the, the pole at, at much, uh, much nearer the end of the, end of the pole than, than anybody before him. And he's able to break the world record no less than 35 times. Imagine that 35 times, that's quite a, that's quite a good going. And he reached a height eventually of over six meters. Uh, second one is beginning in 1963, Irina Rodnina. She starts her, her career in, in ice skating. And she wins 10 world championships and three consecutive Olympic gold medals. Uh, this, this effectively makes her the most successful ice skater in history. It has to be said, she also suffered from, from a series of misfortunes in her life, uh, quite massive misfortunes. Right at the height of her career, she broke several bones in her body. And there were many other, other, other unfortunate instances as well. But despite that, she is still seen as being uh, the most successful ice skater in history. Oleg Blocking uh, should be mentioned. He is, uh, or he became rather, the USSR's greatest footballer. He scored uh, 300 plus goals in, 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 in championships. And he received eventually, he, he played for Dynamo Kiev and then, and then he represented the Soviet Union uh, international team. And he received the European Footballer Award for the year 1975 and the Ballon d'Or. Uh, Gary Kasparov, he is on the right there. So he's the prize winning, of course, most people have heard of Gary Kasparov, the uh, prize winning Soviet chess player. He started out in 1974. This is playing competitive, competitive chess uh, at, uh, in, in Belarus. And he, he, and that, he was only aged 11 at that point. And he went on to become and remain the world champion from 1985 to 1995. I have to say, before we leave this, this, this picture, I, I selected these four people completely at random, more or less. It, it's interesting to note that out of, out of the four, only one of them is a Russian, uh, of Russian origin. The, two are Ukrainian and one is part Armenian and part Jewish, that being Gary Kasparov. The only, only, only Russian one is Irina Rodnina. Next slide. So here we have the propaganda posters that would have been plastered around the Soviet Union at the time, extolling the, the triumphs of their, uh, of their sports teams and athletic uh, performers. So you can see the, the figure on the, on the left is this sort of uh, rather stereotyped image of of manliness and he's got so many gold medals behind him and then in the middle you have this uh again this rather stereotyped image of of uh, manliness and the uh and these his young pioneer son presumably is 
he's, he's feeling his, his father's triceps and thinking, oh, well, what, uh, wait till I grow up and then I can be, I can exceed, exceed the triumphs of my father. Uh, the, the one on the right, I'm not quite sure what this is all about, but it's, it's obviously a race. And it's a woman this time, and she's uh, miles ahead of everybody else, of course. And she's breaking the 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 tape at the end of the at the end of the race. Quite what the parachutes are all about. Um, the paratroopers, I'm really not sure at all. Next slide. Right. So perhaps the most extraordinary story of it all from the history of, of Soviet sports, that is, is that of the so-called Red Army. Now, this was the USSR's ice hockey team. You can see them there on the left. That's when they were playing the USA. And you can see them on the right there. This is just after they've triumphed over Canada in um, that's that's them uh, celebrating after the event, and the and they were all trained up in these special schools which we've been talking about uh, that pushed the players to the maximum, and they also developed innovative new tactics. This was really what what brought about their success. They all relied very very heavily on each other. There was no key players as such. Uh, so they were able to work out what the formula of the Canadian team was and the, how the Canadian team would have key, key players. And they had ways around that, which they uh, defeated them in, in, uh, in 1981. And, and the Canada, up until this point in international ice hockey, had, was, was undefeated. So it was a big shock for the Canadians. Uh, this, this is all uh, taken in a, in a movie. You can, you can see the movie. It's called The Red Army. And it, uh, it's, it's a documentary that records the history of their success and interviews the members who are still alive and it it also uh it, it's quite sad in a sense because as i say by 1983 the u.s team was able to learn from the red army and it eventually was able to defeat them in turn and the the soviet the soviet team it is um, was from that from a few years later on from that the, the 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 funds ran out to support the Red Army and the uh, and the players had to go elsewhere and try and try and get work and they were often ruthlessly exploited so it's quite a sad ending to the movie but a good, a good movie all the same. Thank you.